Hello. In this video, I'm going to summarise Chang Kim and Many Bolburn's article, Blue Ocean Strategy from Theory to Practice, published in the California Management Review in spring 2005. Now, this is just one of a number of articles they have written that explore their concept of blue ocean strategy and value innovation. But I think it's the one that most fully covers the tools they recommend organisations use to create uncontested market space, as they call it. Kim and Marlborough start by drawing a contrast between red ocean and blue ocean industries. Now, red ocean industries are all industries in existence today. Here, industry boundaries are defined and accepted, and the competitive rules are well known. Companies seek to outperform each other to grab greater share of the existing demand. So a zero-sum game, where one company gains, another company loses. Now this area has been the focus of strategy since the 1980s, and Kim and Malbon say it is well understood and helped by the availability of tools to understand market dynamics, Michael Porter's five forces, and also things like the value chain and generic positions to explore strategic positioning. However, over time, red oceans become crowded and supply outstrips demand. And so the pros prospects for profit and growth are reduced. Products become commodities and competition becomes cutthroat, making the ocean bloody and hence the red ocean analogy. Kim and Marburn's research over the last 15 years suggests that while red oceans will always matter, they will be insufficient to sustain high performance. They argue that by just focusing on a strategy of competition, a very important and lucrative aspect of strategy has been missed. That is creating new market space where there are no competitors which they call blue oceans. So rather than taking demand as given and focusing on the supply side to gain advantage, which we call competencies or activity systems, Kim and Marburn see creating demand as the only way to sustain profitability and achieve growth. You're competing where there are not other competitors and the rules of the game aren't set. There are a number of driving forces behind the rising imperative to create blue ocean space. Accelerated technological advances have improved productivity and lowered barriers to entry. Globalisation has intensified competition and greater customer switching is enabled by it being easier to do so and there being many other providers to choose. The result has been an accelerated commoditization of many markets. Price wars are frequent and profit margins shrink. However, there is a perception that the odds of success are lower if firms move beyond existing industry space, beyond accepted boundaries. So the issue is often about how do you succeed in new market spaces at a reduced risk. Well, to start with, whilst there are uh, new blue oceans created well beyond existing boundaries, most of them are created within red oceans by extending existing boundaries. And the question is, how do we help businesses to extend those boundaries in some places. In the next section, Kim and Mulburn describe some of the common characteristics of firms who are successful in creating new blue ocean spaces. In sharp contrast to playing by the traditional rules, they believe market 
boundaries and industry structures are only existing in managers' minds and so can be reconstructed. They reject the view promoted by Porter that firms have to make trade-off choices, perhaps between value and cost, or between differentiation and cost leadership. In blue oceans, Kim and Marvin argue, firms can create both a leap in value for customers and for the firm. Indeed, you could say that in blue ocean spaces, the idea of industry boundaries and trade-off choices become meaningless. To reconstruct industries, practitioners look systematically across established boundaries and reorder the elements traditionally seen to make firms successful. However, it's not about innovating on one or two factors. It's about thinking about the entire system that makes up the company's activities and the new and greater utility that it can provide to customers. Having described their Blue Ocean concept, Kim and Marburn used the rest of the article to detail the tools and frameworks that they have developed to assist managers in formulating a Blue Ocean strategy, and which they've tested with a wide range of companies. Throughout this, they use the example of the US wine industry and the story of an Australian producer, Casella Wines, and its yellowtail brand. The US is a leading consumer of wine, but the $20 billion industry is intensely competitive. Domestic wine producers compete head on with imports from France, Italy and Spain, as well as New World countries such as Chile, Argentina and Australia. Intense competition has fueled ongoing consolidation amongst producers, but also among distributors and retailers as they seek to gain bargaining power. Pressure on price is constant. So clearly a red ocean market. The first framework they introduce is the strategy canvas. This tool has two purposes. The first is to capture the current state of play in the known market space, in the industry today. This allows you to understand where competition is currently investing, the factors on which the industry is competing, and what the customers currently receive in the existing offerings. Here's the example of the US wine industry in the late 1990s. On the horizontal axis are the range of factors that the industry competes on. What the industry sees as matters. Now it's crucial here, this is not from the customer's perspective, this is from the industry's perspective of what they believe it takes to succeed in this industry. So for the US wine industry, obviously price, price per bottle in this case. Um, also competing on a fine image of wine and how that's communicated to customers. The level above the line marketing activity. And of course, the quality of the wine, the prestige of the vineyard and its legacy, and perhaps the sophistication of the taste and also the range of wines that the producer provides. That in terms of grape varieties. These factors are seen as being key to the promotion of the wine. Then the vertical axis is the relative level of each of these factors that a particular player or a particular segment of the market provides. Here we see the level for the premium wines and the four budget wines. As you see, there's an underlying structure to the industry 
with all vineyards trying to provide the same factors, it's just the difference in terms of level that's from one player to another. Play out here, of course, is the classic price versus quality trade-off. You, you provide all these factors at a high level and charge a high price for your wine. You cut costs, you both provide the same level of all the factors and you're in the budget end of the market. Now, Kim and Mulgrew call the actual lines on the strategy canvas the value curves for the sector or for individual players. Now, the conventional logic in the industry is to look at how you could actually reduce costs and so reduce prices or to increase the value that you deliver uh, for that same price. However, Casella Wines rejected these traditional ways of thinking about price and quality in the wine industry and looked to consider how they could make a fun and easy to enjoy wine that people would drink every day. Why? Well, they'd looked at the demand side of industries such as beer, spirits and ready-mix cocktails that capture something like three times as many customers as wine does in the US. Casella found that many Americans saw wine as a turn-off, finding it intimidating and pretentious. By focusing on the traditional factors of industry competition, current rivals had ignored large numbers of non-customers a group that outweighed current wine customers in the US by three to one. Elsewhere, um, Kim and Marlborough suggest another framework that they call the buy utility matrix that helps managers think about these customer pain points, as they call them, that are related to the current offering an industry provides. You might like to see the book Blue Ocean Strategy to find out more about that and how to use it. But with this customer insight, Casella looked to explore how it could create that blue ocean space in the US wine industry. To do this, Casella turned to another of Kim and Morgan's analytical tools, the Four Actions Framework. To challenge an industry strategic logic and craft a new value curve, the four action framework asks some key questions. Firstly, what factors of competition can be eliminated? Often competing factors are taking, taken for granted by an industry, even though they no longer provide value to customers or even detract from the value the firm is offering. Second question, what factors have been over-designed in the race to beat competition, which as a result mean the customer is being over-served in areas that they don't value? In contrast, the third question asks what factors can be increased above the industry standard where an industry hasn't realised the value to the customer or has been the result of the cost value trade-off choices in the past. And then finally the fourth question, what factors can be created to add new demand into that industry? By pursuing the first two questions, eliminating and reducing, the company gains insight into how to drop its cost structure relative to competitors. The second two questions provide insight into how to lift buyer value and so create new demand. Collectively, the four questions allow a systemic exploration of how the firm can offer buyers a experience that better fits their needs, while at the same time, keeping cost structures low, so avoiding having to make a trade-off choice. By then applying the 
output of the four action framework to the strategy canvas, the company gains a new revealing look at old perceived truths and how they don't deliver what customers need. In the case of Casella, instead of offering wine as traditional wine, it positioned it as a social drink accessible to everyone. And within two years, this fun social drink, Yellowtail as they called it, emerged as the fastest growing brand in the history of the Australian and the US wine industries. And it became number one for sales of red wine in the US. It didn't simply steal sales from others. It grew the market, pulling in more than 6 million new customers into the wine market. This is the strategy canvas that Casella Wine developed as a result of the four action framework. By looking at alternative sectors such as beer and ready mixed cocktails, and about what non-customers wanted, they created three new factors of competition. Easy drinking, easy to select, and fun and adventure. And then eliminated or reduced everything else. Casella found that Americans rejected wine because of its complicated taste. They preferred beer and ready mixed cocktails because they were sweeter and easier to drink. Casella could respond to this by reducing the aging time and so making their wine sweeter. And this had the advantage of dramatically cutting the working capital that they required in the business. Customers also found the selection of wine difficult. They were faced by aisles and aisles of different sorts of wines in retailers which they found intimidating and overwhelming, making the selection process very difficult. Casella dramatically cut the range of wines they offered. To start with, it's just focusing on one red wine and one white wine. They also removed any jargon from the bottles, even reference to a Pacific vineyard. They then labelled the bottles with vibrant labels so customers could easily recognise it. To further help with easy selection, they made retail shop employees ambassadors for Yellowtail, giving them Australian orientated clothing and hats. For them, having a wine that they didn't feel intimidated by meant they were more likely to recommend it to their customers. As a result of that below the line marketing, it meant Yellowtail could cut completely above the line marketing. Reducing the range also meant it minimised the level of stock that had to be held, both in the retails and in distribution, and also increased stock turnover. That reduced stockouts and also meant investment in inventory in warehousing costs and in bottling were all reduced. Casella also broke with the refined image of wine. Learning from the marketing of beer, they positioned Yellowtail in line with Australian culture, perceiving it as being laid back, fun and adventurous. The new value curve for Yellowtail shows how Casella was able to pursue a strategy of differentiation and low cost at the same time. They were avoiding the trade-off choices that other wine producers felt they had to make to be competitive. Kim and Mulburn then suggest a final tool to help deliver the insight provided by the four action framework and the new strategy canvas. The eliminate, reduce, raise, create grid pushes firms to act to create that new value. The grid is easy to understand and communicate by managers at every level. So 
Kamoma believes helps create a high level of engagement and speed up the delivery of the new market offering. This grid, Kimamama believe, helped Casella develop a strategy that had focus, that diverged from rivals and had a clear tagline that made it easy to communicate what was required inside the organisation and to partners of that organisation. These three characteristics, they believe, are the litmus test for the commercial viability of Blue Ocean ideas. If a Blue Ocean idea lacks focus, it's highly likely that the cost structure will remain high and the ideas will be difficult to implement. If the idea lacks, lacks divergence from existing players, then the firm is likely to remain stuck in red ocean space. And if it doesn't have a tagline that is understandable both inside the organisation and to customers, it is likely that it will not generate the increased demand the organisation hopes for. Kim and Malbum sum up their article by stressing that firms need to move beyond red ocean markets, especially in these ever-changing times. Focusing just on the industry constraints will mean becoming stuck in red oceans, and that will be damaging for profitability and growth. They believe that the tools that they present help firms find a way to reject this and so open up new blue ocean uncontested market spaces. Thank you.